This is Around the Farm, and I'm your host, Rick Myrup. And as always, we're going to be talking about all things ag. Harvest is here. It's that time of year. Everybody's excited, but they're also a little bit nervous. There's a lot of interesting things that happened at planting this year that are creating difficult challenges and unique situations that some folks may have never seen before. There's a lot to consider, and we've got two experts with us today that are really going to help us to understand things that we need to be looking at as we're looking at a late harvest and some of the things to be concerned with and really get into the details of how you can optimize your operation for this harvest season. Our first guest today is Chris Souter, who is a regional agronomy lead for Bayer Crop Science. And then we also have a farmer from Maynard, Iowa, Brent Scharf, who's joining us today as well. Chris, could you tell our listeners a little bit about yourself and your background and what you do for Bayer Crop Science? Yeah, thanks for the introduction, Rick. So my name is Chris Souter. I am the regional agronomy lead for the Midwest region here in Bayer. I, uh, a little bit about my background, I grew up on a farm in northwest Iowa um, after uh, uh, you know, several years in college, ended up uh, joining what was then Monsanto as a corn breeder for DeKalb in northwest Iowa. And over my uh, 12 years, I've eventually migrated down here to St. Louis and into the commercial teams. And now I lead a team, team of agronomists across Iowa, Missouri, and eastern Kansas. And we're responsible for supporting our, our dealers, customers, and sales managers in the region. Good deal. Now, from northern Iowa, I I need to understand who I'm dealing with here. Where does your NFL alliance lean? I mean, are you a a Vikings fan? Do I have a Minnesota Vikings fan in the studio with me here? I I did fall on the side of the Minnesota Vikings if they're playing either the Packers or the Bears, but uh, my true uh, passion growing up was for the Dallas Cowboys. Oh, that's even worse. (laughs) uh, There's nothing worse than an Iowa Cowboys fan. That's tough. You know, when you you grow up in northwest Iowa and you have the Cyclones and the Cubs, and the Vikings. He spent a lot of years of frustration there in the 90s and early 2000s. Had to had to latch on to somebody with some uh, some potential there for championships. Hey, I, I can understand that as a lifelong Bears fan. My my understanding of sports is just extreme and long term futility. So I can feel your pain there. Well, thank you for joining us this morning. Also with us is Brent Scharf. He's a farmer from Maynard, Iowa. Brent, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and your operation? Yes, yeah, so we're a family farming operation. We're Approximately 40 miles northeast of uh, Waterloo, Iowa. It's kind of cold and chilly and uh, always rainy. Moisture is not a problem up in this area. But uh, we're a Vikings fan. It goes all the way back to Tarkington's days. And so, yeah, that's kind of the introduction for me. Two of you. I'm outnumbered here. At least we won the first matchup of the season here. You know, that was, that was <laughs> basically the only time the Bears have looked good this year was playing you guys. So maybe we just need to play you guys again and I'll feel better about the season. There you go. Well, hey, this isn't the Bears podcast as much as I'd like it to be. This is the Ag podcast here. So let's talk a little bit about harvest and some of the challenges that we've got this year. You know, it was a historically odd planting season. I think that uh, unnormal seems to be the new normal in terms of planting. And when you consider some of the challenges that we're going to have here this year, Chris, talk to us a little bit about, for farmers, uh, especially in those areas where they've had this drawn out and long planting, what types of things do they need to be thinking about as they either get started for harvest this year or start to prep for harvest to prepare themselves for what could be a historically long in duration harvest and could be a harvest that runs for some folks well into December? Yeah, absolutely. So the major uh, major issue facing everybody right now that's uh, front and center is this cold front coming across the upper Midwest. You know, we have snow forecast in the Dakotas and uh, freezing conditions forecasted tonight for uh, Iowa, Minnesota, and several other regions. So that's the major one that I'm sure everybody's uh, staring in the face. But we like to uh, coach people to think uh, and go back all the way to uh, conditions at the time of planting. For those that got in early and for, you know, region I cover with most of Iowa, you know, we define early and on time as late April, early May. You know, we're starting to see those fields come out and yields are good. But from here on out, we're expecting that to to become more and more challenging. So if you were going in late May, early June, you're likely planting into wet conditions, maybe compacted fields, the seed bed wasn't ideal. And that was really going to set the tone for the entire season and mainly uh, in the form of restricted root development. And that's going to eventually lead to plant health, stock integrity, ear health issues uh, as we get closer and closer here to harvest. So trying to be as aggressive as you can, where you can, prioritizing your your harvest order is really where we need people focusing from here on out because the grain that we do still have out there, we want to try to get as much of that in the bin as we can. 
You think about some of the weather challenges. You know, you, you'd mentioned the snowstorm that's forecasted for the Dakotas, the cold temperatures that are coming in some of these geographies. For folks that the crop isn't quite there yet, you know, what do they need to be considering in terms of their decision-making process for really trying to determine when they need to get out there and harvest that crop and, and some of the trade-offs that they're going to have to make potentially in terms of higher moisture at harvest or lower grain quality? Yeah, so yeah, it's going to depend a little bit on the level of frost that they're going to get here tonight and into tomorrow. So if it's just a, areas with a, a light frost and we get a little bit of kill on the, the leaves themselves, that plant's going to continue to develop and the stalk's going to be alive. You're going to see maybe minimal yield loss with those uh, those fields. If we do end up having a killing frost where it's killing everything, including the stalks, then, you know, for those that were not at black layer, you will be at um, essentially black layer now because you won't uh, be packing any more weight into the kernels or uh, soybean seed. So I guess what we, we think about at this point is still continue to get out there and, and scout a couple things. So ear health. We know there are a lot of situations this year where we saw insect pressure late and had the potential to either open up pods. We've seen some examples of stink bugs and soybeans opening up pods, um, late insect feeding in corn, opening up injury on the kernels themselves. So taking a look at that and ranking fields in an order that makes sense to try to maximize your harvestable yield as much as possible is one thing to think about. Maybe even the bigger thing that you should be scouting right now is really going to be that crown health in the lower part of the stalk for our corn plants. The type of year that we had with the wet spring getting hot later in the season, it's a perfect scenario to start setting up fusarium in that lower stalk. And so that's going to impact everything from stalk integrity to shank integrity. And the further and further we go, that's going to be... Uh, it's going to become more and more of a challenge. So look at yield potential, your risk for uh, intactness and standability of that plant. And I'd really start thinking about how do, we, how do we be a little bit more aggressive on those fields that are at high risk. Lots to take into consideration. So let's bring in the guy that's actually living through it at the moment. Brent, so can you talk to us a little bit about how planting went for you folks in your operation? Was it a bit of a challenge there in the spring? Yes, it was very much of a challenge. We basically had three planting windows. We had the uh, April 24th, 25th, 26th to plant. We had the May 14th, 15th, and 16th. And then we had uh, June 1st through June 3rd. And you had to get a lot of acres planted in a short time. Then were our three planting windows. So, yeah, it's a challenge. And uh, we started picking corn yesterday. And the field that I started on, I uh, generally fungicide every field, but uh, this field, for some reason, didn't get fungicided. So that was at 30 to 32 percent. Everything else that I have is basically not mature yet. It's not black layered. And if it is, it's just there and that's it. That's definitely a challenge. You know, you, you think about that level of moisture in, in the crop that you're pulling out there. I mean, what are you thinking about for potential dry down as you think about having such a, uh, a wet crop as you pull that out of the field and try to get that into the bin? That's an interesting thing to say because we're not quite sure. As we look at the week to 10-day forecast, we're not seeing any heat out of that. So I told the guys, I said, you know, Thanksgiving dinner is going to be out this year. And I says, we're going to be bumping up towards Christmas. And uh, we know how many days of harvest we have, and we got to get started sometime. And, and right now where we sit, um, just kind of cloudy days every day, and we're not getting any heat units to bring corn along to maturity. Yeah, I don't think you guys will be the only folks that are going to be eating turkey in the combine. I think that that's going to be something that's uh, a little bit more common than we'd be comfortable with just as, a, uh, as an agricultural community. So when you think about that, I mean, if you look at your operation, have you guys ever had a year like this where you're looking at it going, man, we're, we're going to be harvesting well into December? And, and what were some of the challenges that you can remember if you have run into that before? <laughs> We ran into it in 2009. Um, matter of fact, we didn't get all the corn harvested. We, we had uh, close to a thousand acres left out in the field. Uh, obviously, it snowed and we, and we couldn't get it. And that's a crapshoot in this part of the country because we do get a fair amount of snow. We was fortunate in, in the spring, we did go out and get it. But you do have some harvest loss from that, or I don't call it harvest loss, I call it snow loss. Yeah, it, it wears on a guy a little bit. And uh, I think in 2009, we got corn to maturity, but we just couldn't get it right now. This year, we're not even getting corn to maturity yet. You know, we're on the front part of October, but we're sneaking up towards the middle of October. And it would be nice to try to get corn black layered. Brent, I know you uh, you like to collect data on your operation to help you in the decision-making process. Talk to us a little bit about, you know, 
What additional steps do you have to do to make sure that you're getting good, clean data as you harvest this year and a year where you're going to be having a, a prolonged harvest period? You know, how often are you guys looking at calibrating your combines as you collect that data? We normally calibrate definitely once a day, but even between fields, different uh, varieties of corn, different hybrids of corn, we calibrate between different hybrids because there's different characteristics, uh, depth of kernel, shallow kernel, dryness. It can all vary. And, and <clears throat> I like to have accurate information for a number of reasons for a number of different people. So, yes, I mean, the, the accuracy is a big thing with us. You know, obviously, we have skills on the grain carts, and then we check the grain carts between the grain carts, and then we check, you know, the grain carts dump into the semis, and so then we check the semis uh, across the scale, and, and it's all trickle-down effect. Chris, in a year like this, you know, we're where it's a little bit abnormal. I think a little bit is being generous there. Let's just call it abnormal. What's your thoughts on how farmers like Brent's can use the data that they've collected this year from harvest and still help to educate the decisions that they make planning for next season, understanding that this isn't really a relative uh, season compared to, to most years? I appreciate that question because, you know, in a year like this, the, you know, one of the big risks is that we overcorrect based off of what we saw this year. So what we were talking about earlier in terms of calibrating, getting accurate data in the first place, great first starting point because your moisture is going to be drastically different from that first planting window to the, the later planting window. So having accurate data from these fields is is a great first start. And then second thing I think about is the actual data that we do want to make decisions on. So, you know, Think through your operation for the the fields, the situations that would reflect something that you would see six or seven out of ten years, and that's the data that you start with to make decision based off of your your own data. Other thing is, you know, leverage the tools and the experts we have out there in the industry because they've seen these products across multiple years in different environments, and they may have data from different parts of the country that would reflect what you would normally see. You know, I guess what we could call a more normal year. I don't know if we have those anymore, but uh, boy, data, you know, the way we're collecting data now, the ability we have to aggregate that data, apply some basic or advanced statistics to making sense of that, you know, be prepared to use all those tools at your disposal to try to either not overcorrect or make changes that best reflected what you expect to see in future years. It should be an interesting season. I've, I've talked to a lot of folks that, you know, their sentiment is, hey, you know, we didn't really get to execute the plan last year that we really wanted to. I felt good about the plan, then Mother Nature kicked in, and we didn't get to execute that plan. You know, one thing I've heard a lot of folks say is, hey, we're going to kind of go back to last year's plan, and that's what we think we're going to plan for for this next upcoming season because we didn't actually get to execute against that. Brent, as you guys think about your operation there, you know, how are you guys starting to look at how you're going to plan for this coming season and, and planting? Are you going to make any changes based on learnings from this year, or is it really going to be, hey, let's let's lean on some of those historical things that we've seen before? That's kind of ironic you asked that question. We were just talking about that yesterday. Like last spring, the nitrogen got pushed back. The, uh, you know, anhydrous ammonia was not readily available in our area because, you know, everybody, there was a shortage of, of trucks to basically bring it to the retailers. Now we're getting harvest pushed back in October, November, possibly December. We're almost into the same scenario again. How much field work is going to get done? How much fall nitrogen is going to get put on, if any? Or is it all going to get pushed back to next spring? And we're going to relive the same problem next spring just because, you know, fall is going to get pushed late again. So it could be a back-to-back deal um, is what we're thinking right now. So actually what we're talking, I'm looking outside and we're, <laughs> we're, we've got the tillage tools uh, backed up and we're ready to go with them as soon as we can get some more corn harvest. That's going to be a, a unique challenge for this season as you think about fall fertility. Just planning for the logistics of that. Uh, Brent, are you, are you guys going to try to schedule it where, hey, once we get a field harvested, you know, as quickly as that ground is ready, are you going to try to get somebody into the field to do a fall application? That's our goal. We'll try to get some fertilizer spread on there and get some tillage going right away because we're going to get late. We're going to have frozen ground. We know that, but we got to have some tillage done. 
Chris, from an agronomic perspective, folks are going to be forced into some different practices this year, as, as Brent's talking about there, as you consider not being able to get as much fertility down in the fall as, as you might have planned to. For folks that may not be as, as comfortable or have the history of doing more spring-applied fertility or even in-season fertility, what are some things that they need to consider as part of their plan as they uh, start to put together their planting plan for next year? Yeah, so I think, you know, one, going into the spring with a, a plan, having your inputs lined up, thinking about where you're going to prioritize ahead of, of planting. Those are all going to be things that they're going to have to consider because if, if they're not able to get um, get nutrients down this fall, it's going to make even next spring more and more compressed. We see this year over year. Anytime we get uh, one delay somewhere in a season, it just tends to snowball. Um, you know, we eventually recover and come out of it. But I'd say, you know, continue to focus on what we know, the basics about when it's right to go in with tillage, when it's right to put down fertility. You know, don't be reckless, but uh, uh, definitely act with a sense of urgency. If we're reckless, you make those mistakes and they tend to live with you across the full season. You know, Brent, as is, uh, is the planting season drew out, there were a lot of folks that ended up having to swap out some products and get a, a different maturity of product. I don't know if you guys had to run into that at all, but were you in a spot where you had to plant any hybrids or varieties this year that were maybe a little bit earlier than you typically have planted and you hadn't seen before? We didn't have to go to the extreme, or I didn't go to the extreme this year. In the middle of May, we were still planting oh, 110 to 113 day maturities where we're at. We got into that first of June and, and we had to swap out a fair amount of hybrids. And, and we went earlier, we went down to the 103 to 105 day range there. That was still probably stretching it for our part of the country, but I didn't want to jeopardize yield right off the bat. But it was it was certainly a challenge this spring. There, there's no doubt about it. So as you look at harvesting those crops that are earlier maturity than you would typically plant in an ideal year, are there any key concerns for you as, as you get out into the field and try to harvest those products that uh, are a little bit earlier than what you would normally plant on the operation? Well, then we went out, we did kernel counts and stuff like that. And, and the June planting really has some good kernel counts. Um, the issues that I'll have is, is once we get into it, you know, test weight number one, depth of kernel number two. I, I think them two might jeopardize our yield a little bit with that uh, late planted corn. As far as kernel counts, the kernel kernels are actually absolutely there, but I, I just don't know if the weight of the ear is going to be there. So, I mean, we're going to jeopardize some yield. There's no doubt about it, but we didn't have much of a choice. In our area, there's a fair amount of June corn planted and uh, first of June and uh, a fair amount of June beans planted also. Hey, everybody's got a plan until the planter starts to roll, right? And then it's execute, execute, execute at uh, whatever the weather allows you to do. So can understand some of those challenges there. Hey, Chris, you know, we've talked about it a little bit, the, the potential for frost, the potential for very cold weather or even snow. We're all hoping for a temperate fall, right? We're, we're hoping that these, these temperatures hold out for us. We hold off on snow well into November based on the season we're having. But the reality is some folks are going to get hit with this, right? Some folks are going to have to deal with potentially multiple frost, potential killing frost, fields that still have crop in them that are, that are going to get snowed on. What can you tell farmers that may run into that if you, if you do experience a heavy frost or a number of frosts? or have some snowfall, what things do they need to be looking at for then harvesting those fields after they've experienced those types of cold weather events? Yeah, just in, in terms of the yields that you're going to get off those fields, you are you're definitely at the mercy of Mother Nature there. What we were talking about earlier in terms of a plant stage, if you've reached black layer at this point, you're not going to be losing any more yield from that frost, but it's probably going to impact your dry down. You know, the dry down curves that we have in our, our products shift quite a bit as we move into October, back into September, roughly drying down by about three quarters to a full percent of moisture per day. But as we move forward, we're Really, that uh, that could be anywhere from a tenth of a percent to a quarter of a percent per day. So that's going to be a little bit slower. I wouldn't wait too long an, on that just because, you know, like I said, we get into November and uh, the risks that we have, whether it be additional rain that could be impacting grain and stock quality, uh, wind events start to start to pick up as we move later into the fall. Um, so being aggressive as we can when the conditions are right to get the, the equipment in the field. Now, if we end up with a, a fall like we did last year in Iowa, where we had a lot of wet fields, there was a risk that uh, 
taking your grain carts, your harvest equipment, the field in terms of compaction. In some cases, we just didn't have a choice. But, uh, you know, if all things being equal, it'd be great to go in those fields that are a little bit more solid. But uh, we understand at some point you're going to have to get in there. Brent, as you go through a year like this where harvest moisture is going to be a big deal, where there's going to be potential dry down costs that you're going to incur, does that impact the way that you look at your seed selection for next season? Are you starting to look at it and go, man, I, I need to really be focused on products that are going to dry down quickly and in case we run into this again, give me a little bit of benefit or a little bit of insurance against uh, another potential late harvest? Um, yeah, to a certain extent, it, it does. I guess I, I plant a lot of corn falling corn and, and uh, so we normally spread out our maturities a little bit, um, but we, we don't go on the early side too much just because I, we're set up to dry corn. Um, not everybody's, you know, set up to do that. And so I don't have a little, I don't have any problem pushing the envelope just a little bit farther, but certainly in that 103 to 105 day corn, I would definitely plant a little bit more of that so we can get a good start now. I think some of that corn right now is just, you know, black layered mature. The driest I've heard in our is 28% right now, uh, corn. I don't know if we stooped any lower in maturity, if our corn would be any drier right now. It's just this last month has just been kind of, you know, gloomy and cloudy and, and a little bit rainy. And, and uh, uh, we just, the corn just hasn't pushed along to get to that maturity level. Now, Brent, I know that you folks use FieldView on your farm to capture data. Can you talk to us a little bit about, has there been any benefit for your operation in collecting planting data in a season like this to be able to track and remember which fields were planted when and to be able to take that into consideration as you look at harvest here? Absolutely. I hunt through that probably almost on a daily basis. When certain fields got planted, obviously we had you know some hybrids get changed uh, in fields because that's not the way we planned it because of the spring. So, yeah, the other night we was going through that. I, I went through it again this morning. Where can we go harvest again? Is there any other fields that I missed the fungicide on that might be just, you know, two points drier than anything else? Um, the side dressing. Uh, we record everything, you know, when we lie drop. And, and uh, so I was going through that. Hey, what 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 do we got there? And you know, I'm trying to I'm trying to figure out the correlation of, of when we can harvest, and and then we use it later on also the correlation with fungicide, no fungicide, and the side dress deal. Uh, we do a lot of wide dropping. Obviously, like I said earlier, our nitrogen program changed because we couldn't get anhydrous here, so we changed nitrogen programs. We we use more liquid, and it gives us that flexibility. But also now this time of year, we tend to forget what goes on. No matter where I'm at, I can grab the iPad, bring it up, and say, you know, well, this field just got 32%, or this field got anhydrous, or this field got both, and that's why it's yielding like that, you know. It's definitely valuable information at the fingertip. You don't have to go back to that office into the desktop. It's always a fun time of the year when you get to evaluate harvest performance. In a year like this that was abnormal, I think we've said that once or twice, you know, when you look at new products that you might have been trying for the first time this year, Brent, how are you going to go about evaluating those new products in an abnormal season like this? Is it going to be a bit of an outlier year? Or are you going to really be bought into some of those new products or are you still going to be a, a little bit hesitant with those? I'm, I'm more on the hesitant side, I would guess, just because, you know, this is kind of a different type of year. Every year is not like this year. Now, as the summer was rolling along, we thought things are, you know, we was catching up pretty good on GDUs and growing, growing the units. And and, uh, and then all of a sudden, here in September, we've just really stalled out. So it's really not a fair guesstimate on what certain hybrids are going to do and how, how they're going to finish and mop them. Chris, as you look at this harvest season, and I'm, you're going to be looking at a lot of corn results, right, and, and soybean results as well. What's your advice for folks about how they evaluate performance this season and evaluate potentially new hybrids that they looked at this year, new products that they looked at this year, and start their planning for this next season? So the past corn breeder in me is always excited about the new products, and I have a lot of a lot of confidence in the system that we use to bring those products forward. But not everybody has access to that data, so I understand uh, taking a critical look at the performance this year and if it's going to be repeatable or not. So number one, I, I think start with, uh, you know, your early planting, on-time planting data, that's a good place to start with data this year. Leverage uh, data from your agronomist, from your sales team. What we talked about earlier, keeping those records in field view to help assess, hey, what were the conditions that these new products performed under this year or didn't? 
that's great information to have at your fingertips, but also share that with your seed sales rep because they can use that to then say, yeah, we may want to take and give this product another year evaluation before getting aggressive with it. Or it may be information that confirms with what we knew about that product when it came out of our breeding pipeline. And, you know, if we can confirm uh, what we saw the previous year, then maybe those are the products that we take a little bit more of an aggressive stance on, on working into our portfolio. So, a lot of our growers may not have access to that multi-year data, but uh, there's a pretty good chance your agronomist and, and your sales reps do. So I would uh, I'd really ask and push on them to tell you a little bit about the history of those products, and that can, that can really help you on uh, product selections for this fall. Lots to consider as folks get started with harvest this season. I know a lot of folks are ready to turn the page and start to focus on next year, get past this year, but lots to consider around potential weather impact of, uh, of frost, cold weather, potential snow. Appreciate both of you coming in this morning and talking with us a little bit and sharing some of your insights and experiences with our listeners as they get prepared to get out into the field and get through harvest this fall as well. Hey, Around the Farm is brought to you by Climate Field View. Don't miss any of our episodes. Remember to subscribe to our podcast on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Google Play, or anywhere else you get your podcasts. You can also find our episodes on climate.com. I want to hear from you. If you have any thoughts or questions, you guys have the best ones. Go to our FieldView Twitter handle, at FieldView. Use the hashtag FieldViewATF so I can find your tweet and we'll answer your questions in upcoming episodes. And before you close out the podcast, how about giving us a review? We wouldn't turn down a five-star rating. And as always, we'll see you around the farm.